Hey guys, welcome back to the Dad Tired Podcast. If you want to watch or listen to this podcast uh, in video form, you can do that by going to YouTube or to Spotify and you can watch the interview, not just listen to it. So that's an option for you if you want to do that as well. Um, you're going to hear me say in this conversation a couple times uh, how uh, my guest is controversial. Um, I, I'm trying to kind of branch out and have more in-depth, harder conversations, not just in this conversation, but many of the conversations we've had in the last few months and years and for the ones to come. Like, I just want to have a lot of conversations that challenge our thinking, that get us thinking outside the box. Um, you know, we'll, maybe we agree with everything. Maybe we disagree with everything. That The point is that we're just having rich, meaningful conversations that really challenge us and make sure that we're always landing on truth. So anyway, as you hear me say that today, uh, talking about, oh, this is controversial, um, that's on purpose. I want to have deeper, richer conversations on this show. So just know that that's intentional part of what we're doing here at That Tired is we're trying to grow to be the men that God's called us to be, to think well and to live righteously. Um, speaking of which, if you're brand new to Dad Tired and you're just stumbling upon the podcast, we are more than just a podcast. We have all kinds of resources to help equip you as the spiritual leader of your home. If you go to dadtired.com, you'll see we have hats and we have books for you as a man. We have devotionals. We have um, uh, this brand new uh, devotional cards that we just put out. So if you you don't really know how to get your kids to talk about Jesus or how to have intentional conversations about Jesus with your kids, if that feels awkward or clunky to you, um, you can pick up these dinnertime devotional cards and read them around the dinner table or in car rides. It makes it very casual and easy uh, it's an easy way for you to kind of point the conversation back to Jesus in really casual way. So again, those are the dinner time discussional cards. We just put those up. We also have children's books for you to read to your kids. Uh, I just, if you're watching, I just pointed the wrong direction. That's a brand new children's book that we have there. Um, so you can pick up that on Amazon or at dadtired.com. You'll also see our annual retreat. This is something we do every year. We get together and we do our big annual retreat. That's about to close up. So if you want to come to that, make sure you come to that. Um, we also do, sorry to bombard you with like announcements. I feel like I'm doing church announcements right now, uh, which nobody listens to. So if you, please hang with me. <laughs> um, if you have not been to or you have seen, we do these one-day conferences all around the country and world every year. These are usually booked six months to a year in advance. So if your church wants to host one of these, we would love to get in touch with you and talk to you about what it looks like to host one of these conferences. Again, we do them all over the country, all over the world, and we would love to come to your church and equip the men of your church to be the men that God's called them to be. If you want to be part of that, shoot us an email, hello at dadtire.com, or you can go to dadtire.com and click the one day conferences tab, and you can kind of get more information about what it would look like for you and your church to host one of these conferences. I want to thank my friends over at Reformation Heritage Books for sponsoring today's episode. I love the website. I love their resources and what they're doing to put good, godly, theologically sound resources in the hands of all kinds of folks. And uh, I'm a big fan of that uh, here at Dad Tired. If you want to start reading the Puritans, which I suggest that you do, um, I would highly suggest you check out this series that they have called the Puritan Treasure Treasures for Today. It makes these riches, the riches of these godly writers of old, um, accessible for the modern reader. Maybe if you've read some Puritan stuff, you're like, that sounds really good and I like it. Just hard to read because it's not in our everyday language, where well, they put it in updated modern language. Um, and they also give helpful introductions and they have these, um, they, they, they kind of put these in, in a way that is easy for you to read. They've got work from writers like John Owen, Jeremiah Burroughs, uh, and more. And they're just, it's a great starting point for a curious reader, somebody who might be curious about the Puritan um, writings, which again, I highly suggest that you check out. So they have this resource, Puritan Treasures for today. I try to read a chapter of these before I go to bed, uh, if possible, just to kind of get my mind thinking about godly things before I head to bed, either this um, and or some scripture um, before, last thing I do before I fall asleep. If you go to heritagebooks.org forward slash Puritan Treasures, you can use the promo code Dad Tired. They'll actually give you 10% off your order. Again, that's heritagebooks.org forward slash Puritan Treasures and use the promo code Dad Tired to get 10% off. That being said, let's dive into today's episode. Pastor Wilson, so excited for you to be on our show today. Um, for those who may not be familiar with you, tell us who you are and what you're up to these days. Okay. My name is Douglas Wilson. I'm the senior pastor at Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. 
which is up in the panhandle of Idaho. And uh, I'm pastor is my day job, uh, but I also do a good a good bit of writing and mm. have written a number of books on family and child rearing. Yeah, which I I wish we had several hours to spend together because I want to pick your brain on all the uh, things family and child rearing. Um, before we jump into all of that, uh, I actually heard you. I, I think I was traveling. I was on an airplane, and uh, I, I was first introduced to you. Um, probably like many uh, through your Tucker Carlson podcast uh, okay. interview with him. Um, and I, since what you described, what you talked about on that podcast and, and what you shared was very intriguing to me, I ended up kind of going a deep dive into you, your writing, your, your sermons. Um, and what I found is other people say that you're controversial and okay. I've even maybe heard you kind of allude to that. But after listening to hours of content from you, I'm trying to figure out what is it about you <laughs> that makes you controversial. Yeah. Um, what would you say? Like, why would why what would you say? Uh, the reason is people would say you're controversial. Yeah, it would it would depend on the topic. So, for example, uh, some people who think I'm controversial and are uh, and I put them off their feed um, would say, "Well, Wilson's done some good work in education." But if you get him into politics, get him on political subjects, then he's a firebrand or something like that. Mm. Uh, so or history. Um, uh, the, and then I so that's one of the things where people just disagree with certain takes that I have mm. and have reacted emotionally. And then there are other people who I think are opposed to our broader project, uh, which we summarize uh, by our tagline, which is all of Christ for all of life. And, and they object to that so holistic approach. Mm -hmm. And so consequently hunt around for a rock to throw. And there are various rocks that they've found one of, you know, uh, I've been a pastor here for 40, 40 plus years. And our church is uh, our church and church community is the size of a small town. And so people, still in our church community still sin, for example, mm -hmm. and there've been some, um, uh, molestation cases and, mm -hmm. you know, controversial cases, which people then diagnose from 2000 miles away on, mm -hmm. uh, so, so the pastoral uh, people are critical of, uh, how we've handled a, an abuse case or something like that, I see. but they're doing this many times, many times from thousands of miles away, years after the fact with only a handful of um, of the facts involved. And so th that's a handy rock to throw right. if you don't if you don't want um, uh, if you don't want to listen to the other stuff we're saying. So sometimes it's cultural, historical, sometimes it's doctrinal, sometimes it's um, just uh, snark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said that they um sometimes get offended by the all of Christ for all of life statement. Who is they and what is so offensive about that? Well, uh, a lot of evangelical Christianity is, is dualistic um, where uh, when you become a Christian, Jesus saves your soul such that you'll go to heaven when you die. And in the meantime, you should live a decent middle-class existence here be honest in business and stuff like that. But uh, there's no real emphasis on cultural transformation. Mm. Um, and we are post-millennial in our eschatology. We, we are transformationalists. Mm. We believe that 500 years from now, the fact that millions of Christians were living here ought to make a big difference in mm. what goes on and doesn't go on. So, um, so it's, it's that sort of thing. So, yeah, when you, for, for some of our audience, we've got a lot of young dads listening who are just, they're working their, uh, nine to five job and just trying to figure out how to survive their marriage and, and uh, family life. So can you describe maybe in layman's terms, when you say we're post-millennial in our theologic, our theology, what do you mean by that specifically and how it relates to somebody who might take offense to what you're saying? Yeah. So most um, most North American evangelicals are premillennial in their eschatology, which translates into the world's falling apart 
it's going to get worse and worse, and we're living in the end times, and the Antichrist is about to take over. <clears throat> the challenge with that is that sometimes people fall into the trap of thinking, well, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. Um, the only thing you can do is sort of gather your people together and try to survive. Yeah. Um, that's, that is a very common eschatological view. Uh, we are historically optimistic. That's, that's how I would summarize post-millennialism. We are historically optimistic. We believe that before Jesus returns, he will return to raise the quick and the dead. But before he returns, the Great Commission will be successfully fulfilled. Nations will come to Christ and uh, dads will learn how to be shepherds and, mm. uh, and leaders in their homes. Mm. Yeah, I remember you talking about that uh, in, the, in the interview I originally heard you on and talking about how, and that is what gives you hope. Because um, you spent right. most of your interview talking about how you know, we are kind of in this disarray as a, as a people and as a society, but you're actually not hopeless. And that was really, that really fascinated me when you said that. Um, I think I'm one of the biggest reasons, um, that I was in, I, I'm intrigued by you and your story and what you're doing is actually the part of you personally as a man, um, husband and, um, father and, and now granddad, um, can, great granddad, actually. great. Oh, congratulations. Well, yeah, thanks. So, I mean, I just have a, a lot of people can talk the talk, you know, people can listen to my podcast, but the reality is I'm a rookie dad. Like my marriage <laughs> is still fairly new and my, I'm very young in this parenting journey. Um, and so I don't have a lot of skin in the game yet. You shouldn't put a lot of respect towards me in these areas yet because I don't have a lot of, <laughs> I don't have, have a lot of experience in it, but you, I look at a, a man like you and you've been faithful. You've been faithful to your church and to your wife and uh, you have kids who love Jesus. I, I'd love to maybe, can you tell our audience, like, give some family background on you, your marriage, your kids, your grandchildren? Okay. <clears throat> That's a great question, by the way, because it all comes down to, um, it all comes down to people. We're people having to live in this world, and we have to we have to play cards with the hand that we were dealt. Mm. Um, and you're going to have all kinds of personalities born into your home. Um, mm. And y your kids are going to have to deal with you as people and you have to deal with them as people. So um, th this goes back, frankly, to my dad, uh, who was converted while he was a midshipman at the Naval Academy. Mm. So um, he uh, didn't have a Christian upbringing, but he was converted as a young adult uh, while he was in the Navy. And he graduated in the class of 50, uh, went to um, went off, to, uh, was home ported out of Japan, all through the Korean War. He met my mom there, who was a uh, missionary to Japan. Uh, she had been converted when she was 16, uh, didn't have a Christian upbringing either. Um, she had been converted, went to Bible school, and then went to the mission field. So, um, my, both my parents were first generation evangelical believers in the post-war era. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at that time there was virtually nothing available to Christian uh, husbands and wives and, and Christian parents. Uh, right now there's a huge industry of Christian books and materials and, um, family and marriage stuff. Uh, there, there's boatloads of material now. Some of it is even pretty good, <laughs> um, but there was there was a real paucity of material. Um, so my my parents, as first generation Christians that didn't have a Christian upbringing to look back to, were very they they were very consistent, uh, loving Christians, and they just went to the Bible and said, okay, we need to. <laughs> How are we going to how are we going to do this yeah. and they they uh, extracted certain principles from scripture that don't freq don't frequently make it into marriage material um, mm. uh, just principles for walking with God uh, one of them that I learned from my folks was we in our family we call it keeping short accounts mm. um, so and it's a foundational principle for your relationship with God, 
your relationship with your your friends and and fellow church members and your relationship with your wife and your husband and your relationship with your kids and keeping short accounts means deal with sin now yeah don't let it fester don't let it wait don't let sin accumulate deal with it now mm-hmm. and the illustration that i use is is um, imagine two homes side by side uh five kids in each household um The wives are good friends. The husbands are good friends. They work at the same company. They both drive the same kind of minivan. Everything's the same. Only one house is cluttered and knee-deep in debris, and the other house is clean, immaculate. Hmm. The difference between the two homes is not how many T-shirts get put on in the morning, because that's the same. Hmm. It's not how many breakfast bowls get used in the morning, because that's the same. It's not how many shoes get kicked off or not at the door, because that's the same, right? Uh, The two houses, and in short, the two houses get dirty at roughly the same rate of speed. The reason one house is clean all the time is because people pick up right away, right? They don't don't let it, it, it's not, well, we'll do a cleanup, we'll pick up on Saturday. And then, of course, Saturday comes and something arises and and so the and so what i I cover this is it's the centerpiece of my pre marriage counseling, and I lay out this illustration, and I tell the young couple in five years, your marriage is one of those two houses hmm. okay in five years, your marriage is one of those two houses. You will either have a culture of deal with sin now, hmm. pick it up now, clean it up now, or you will have a culture of kick it under the sofa. Uh, let it ride. Maybe time will fix it. And if uh, if you put it off, if you don't uh, practice this principle of short accounts, uh, you're going to have a cluttered and debris-filled marriage, a cluttered and debris-filled family. So I was brought up this way. I was I'm the oldest of four kids. Uh, I was brought up with our our family, just keeping short accounts. Deal with sin now. Don't let don't let it pile up. Um, and then when I got married. Well, sorry, sorry uh, to interrupt you. What did that look like practically in that in your home? What did keeping short accounts look like practically? What it, what it means is let's say someone uh, at the dinner table, so, uh, there's conversation going on and someone gets annoyed mm-hmm. and um, snaps at somebody. Okay. It looks like 30 seconds later, that person saying, I got annoyed. I'm very sorry. I shouldn't talk that way. Mm. Please forgive me. Mm. That's what it looks like. You pick it up 30 seconds later instead of it coming out eight years later in counseling. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. So, um, uh, so one time, uh, when I was a little, little boy, my dad disciplined me in annoyance. Uh, I was being a uh, slow poke and putting the toys away to, before I would go into bed. And my dad was going off to lead a Bible study and was very short with me in, in how he disciplined me. And then he left uh, and then sat in the car outside and then came back in. Mm-hmm. And I still remember that I was, must have been four or five wow. when this happened. Um, sat in my bed, sought my forgiveness for being short and how he disciplined and how he disciplined me. Wow. And I knew that I deserved it. I, you know, I knew that it was uh, not uncalled for discipline. But th- what that telegraphs to everybody in the family is that God is the authority in this home. Yeah. Um, my parents are my parents are authorities, but it's a small a authority because they're under authority as well. Uh, so when uh, when I got married, uh, we had uh, we had this operating assumption of keeping short accounts from the f- very first. And uh, we wanted to live that way with uh, with one another. Nancy is my wife, so, which we did. We developed a handful of handful of house rules to help to remind us to keep short accounts. Um, and then our kids grew up with that. Uh, we've got three kids. Um, uh, they are now... Uh, our kids are now middle aged. Our kids, and we have eighteen grandkids. So three, three kids, eighteen grandkids, and it's been a delight. All, all our kids live here in Moscow, 
Um, so it's been a delight watching our um, older grandkids grow up, hmm. three of whom are uh, married, two of them have a baby and one's expecting. And then the youngest grandchild is not yet two years old. So it's quite a, uh, it's a big spring. quite a range. Yeah. And we, we have seats on the 50 yard line where we're able to watch how our kids bring up their kids and now watch how our grandkids are going to be bringing up their kids. And the thing, is, and the thing that's delightful about it is that, uh, everybody's a Christian. They're all, um, there are no defections. There are no apostasies. There are no, um, people in, in a blue funk or a rebellion. Uh, they all love the Lord and are walking with him and the family, the extended family gets together weekly we have a Sabbath dinner uh, preparing for the Lord's Day, preparing for worship in the morning. Uh, we have a Sabbath dinner where everybody congregates, and it's something like 30 people. I'd have to do the math. Um, 30 people without guests. So it's frequently uh, a weekly meal of 30 to 50 people um, gathering together to fellowship and prepare for the Lord's Day. So it's very much a tangible family centered thing and it's but it can only be family centered because it's god centered hmm. i had about 10 questions pop up as you were describing all that so many like what did you do right to have all your children and grandchildren who loved you i mean that's the goal for every one of us listening that you're yes. living in the the blessing man um and all of us want that as dad so that that was a question that popped up uh, I want to know, like, did you? When did you start those Sabbath dinners? Uh, were your kids were your kids young when you started those? Yeah. Uh, we start, yeah. We started the Sabbath dinners maybe twenty three or twenty four years ago. Okay. So we've been doing it for. Uh, uh, but our our kids were mostly grown, so they were uh, college age. Okay. Uh, uh, when we when we started, um, and so we've been we've been doing it for a, a, a few decades and and then some. Uh, one of the things I would hasten to say, uh, you're, you're exactly right. It is a great blessing to ha see all your descendants walking with the Lord uh, and n not walking in perfection, not walking, of course, yeah. uh, you know, but walking with the Lord, trusting, trusting God. Uh, and the thing I, I want to emphasize is that it's not by works. Okay. It's not by works. Salvation, everybody's salvation your kids and your grandkids' salvation included, is the grace of God. Yeah. It's the gift of God. Um, and so the the way you approach this is by faith, trusting. Hmm. So the, the, so the, I, one of the books I wrote on child rearing is called Standing on the Promises. And st Standing on the Promises is um, the foundation is, does God give Christian parents assurances or promises concerning their children. Okay. And I think the answer to that is yes, hmm. but, but you, you say, but how come if that's the case, if God promises the salvation of children to Christian parents, then why do I know some sweet people at church whose kids are wayward and right. uh, apostate and in all kinds of trouble? Why, uh, what, what happened to the promise man? Right. Well, um, the best illustration I can come up with or counterexample I can come up with is the promises in Scripture concerning answered prayer. Okay? Uh, there are two kinds of prayers in Scripture. One is the kind of prayer that the Lord prayed in Gethsemane. This is my request, um, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, where it's a prayer of submission to the decrees of God. But then there are there's some other passages that say, and whatever you ask, ask in my name, believing, and you've got it. Right, right. Um, they they there's a handful of passages that seem to be blank check promises. Right, right. Here here you go. Just cash this in, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you say, okay, I know Christians who pray intensely for certain things to happen that don't happen. And that's apparently a Gethsemane type of situation, hmm. right? But these other prayers, they're, they're, they are to be prayed sometime. They're, I mean, the verses are there for some reason. They apply some, somewhere. 
Um, and I believe that God has given um, promises to parents, and those parents who apprehend those promises by faith, who look at the promise and say, I'm just going to trust God for this, God gives them that gift of being able to pick up that promise and trust him. Um, th- that it results in work, but it's not on the basis of work, the work at all. So um, did people will say, did you have a devotional time at the dinner table? Y- yeah, we did that. And did you provide a Christian education for your children? Yeah, we did that. But it, that's not why this happened. Um, that's sort of the res- everything proceeds from trusting God. So we're, we want to just trust God for our kids, and that's going to result in kids trusting God also, and also result in us wanting to do things together, right? So it's a cart and horse thing. Don't ever confuse the cart for the horse. Yeah, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to understand that fully. So. Would you say, because we all know families who, who in our churches that, you know, love Jesus and their kids aren't walking with the Lord. Um, you, would you say that that was a lack of trust for them? Yes. Yes. Um, and and this is not so that you can come along and kick a grieving parent in the head <laughs> <Right>. with, <laughs> yeah, totally. you know, uh, yeah. let me tell you all the things you did wrong. Um, but I've been a pastor for four decades plus. And when I've seen kids veer off, when I've seen kids, um, uh, you know, lose their faith or, or rebel against God, it's not exactly a mystery why. Hmm. Okay. I'll just put it that way. Hmm. Um, and sometimes it's the, the issue is not, uh, the, uh, I would say three quarters of the time, it's not because the parents were tyrannical and abusive and and yelled Bible verses at their kids all the time. Almost always it was because the parents were too soft or too indulgent or mm-hmm. not um, they not authoritative enough in what they gi- in, in not giving the kind of structure, emotional structure, spiritual structure uh, that their kids needed. Now I see why they call you controversial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just needed to sit down with you for a couple yeah. of minutes to really get to the controversy. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's fascinating. That's interesting. I think a lot of people will have to chew on that um, and wrestle with that, you know, as right. with what you're saying. It, this, but here's this is the thing. As my, again, this is something I learned from my dad. God takes you from where you are, not from where you should have been. Let me think about it for a second. Okay. God takes you from where you are, not where you not should have where been. You should have been. Okay. Elaborate. So let's, yeah. say, let's say you've got a dad watching this podcast, mm-hmm. um, and he's got a 12-year-old son who's starting to be a little bit surly. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Now, if that dad were in my congregation and he were coming to me for pastoral counsel, I might be able to, having watched him interact with his son, I might be able to say, well, I saw this a couple of years ago and I saw this and I saw how you were, I saw how you coach your son in basketball, you know, th- that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and he, he could slap his forehead at which point I say, but God takes you from where you are, not from where you should have been. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. You, when you, when you view the game film, it's not so that you can accuse yourself so that you can feel like dirt. Um, because that's not going to be a good parenting. <laughs> right. Kids, kids don't need a dad who feels like dirt, right? They need a dad who walks with God in humility, but not a dad who's just uh, collapsed in on himself. Yeah. Um, and so it's important to say, okay, what does God want you to do taking it from here? Now, I'm, I'm convinced that dads, and this is one of the things that we learn from Scripture— Dads have a, mon- a place of monumental importance in the lives of their children. And so I don't have any problem envisioning a dad who did all kinds of things wrong coming to grips with that when he's 65 and his son is 45 and having a conversation with his son that goes home because God takes you from where you are, not from where you should have been. Mm-hmm. Right. 
uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So uh, your your fatherhood does not evaporate uh, s- simply because your son has grown, simply because your son is in college. Your fatherhood d- does not does not evaporate. I think one of the things we hear a lot as parents with young ones is, you know, one of the keys to success with your parents in regards to discipline specifically is be consistent. And one of the challenges I found as a dad of four, and I've watched my peers with their kids, is you try to be consistent, but we don't even really know what to do. (laughs) So we're, how do, what do, I'll be consistent for a month, you know, in regards to discipline. And I'm like, that doesn't, I feel like I'm making no progress. So I better try a new technique. And then I right. try that for a month, and that's like, well, maybe that worked for that child, but didn't work at all for this child. Uh, can right. you, can you? I, I listened to a whole sermon that you gave, or it was maybe it was a parenting conference you did at your church on discipline. I found it in, incredibly helpful. One of the things you talked about in that conference was joy, which surprised me, um, mm-hmm. and removing the child from the joy of the family. I don't know if you remember talking about, about that, but it was that was very very interesting and helpful for me. I've talked about it actually on this podcast. But can you give us some thoughts on discipline as Christian parents? Uh, yeah, let me start with that uh, thing. God placed our first parents in the Garden of Eden, which was a, a garden of yes in a world full of yes. Hmm. Okay? There was one no. Hmm. Okay? <laughs> now, a lot of Christian parents put their kids in a garden of no's. <laughs> <laughs> And there's one yes at dinner time. We'll give you some gruel, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I, I want to be a biblical parent. I want to, and that means being a strict parent. Uh, yeah, every every parent is strict, and every parent is parent is lenient. Lenient. It's what you're lenient about, and it's what you're strict about. Um, so one of the um, the the cultivation of joy. First, let me. Um, point back to the short accounts point because sin is the great joy disruptor. Yeah, totally. Okay. So if you make a mess and you get the vacuum cleaner right away and you clean up the mess, you're restoring joy. You're making joy possible again. Yeah. That's um, good. Right. That, that's the, the first thing. The second thing is when a kid develop, well, let's say one of your kids develops a stink eye, a, a stink attitude and they're, um, just walk in the line <laughs> as as they some they fig, and they figure out right where the line is and they walk along it like a drunk by the highway with a <laughs> yeah. I had a three year old by the way doing that about two minutes before we jumped on this podcast yeah so uh, so um that happened that happens. I remember one time saying to uh saying to Nancy, we're gonna watch this child, and if one toe goes over the line, the roof's gonna fall in because, because they were, they were cruising for it. They were asking for it. Yeah. And one misstep. Okay. Then you, um, and there was a bad attitude and and then one toe across the line. And then we disciplined sort of sharply decisively. And then that child was a bundle of joy afterwards because sin is an attitudinal corrosive, Hmm. Right. If you deal and if you deal with the sin, it restores them to the to fellowship in the family. Mm. And this goes back to how I remember um, uh, when I was a boy. I don't remember the particular incident, but I remember the scenario. Um, my dad used to take us to the basement for discipline and uh, and he would take us there. There'd be an opportunity for the defense, which was usually pretty thin. Uh, <laughs> My my defense attorney was lousy, <laughs> uh, and he would discipline discipline us, uh, spank us, mm-hmm. and then he would pray with us. Mm. Okay, uh, so, and then say something like, "Okay, as far as we're concerned, this matter is completely resolved. As far as we're concerned, it <clears throat> it never happened. Mm. Okay, you are completely and entirely forgiven." And as soon as you're prepared to act like it's completely and entirely forgiven, you're welcome to rejoin us at the dinner table. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> and I remember sitting in the uh, 
down in the basement after a discipline event, listening to the happy clink of silverware upstairs, mm-hmm. wondering why am I down here in the ba- why am I down here in the basement when I could just accept my forgiveness and be rejoined to the family. Mm-hmm. Well, if the if the family is a place of conversation and joy and fellowship and laughter, if that's the way, if that's the ordinary environment and then sin disrupts it and then uh, discipline calls attention to the disruption Mm. the child is outside the joy of that fellowship and knows it yeah but really loves the fellowship of the family and wants back in yeah okay so a a danger sign for for parents who discipline um let's say um a kid pops off at does something bad and uh so they get spanked and then the child runs after the spanking the child runs down the hall yelling i hate you i hate you i hate you okay and then a couple of hours later things blow over kind of that's not healthy that's that's not healthy because the what you want is to have the child when you when you discipline the child for their bad behavior or bad attitude, and I'll get to that next, you discipline for the, the bad behavior, you should want their reflex action to be to turn back to you mm. for comfort. Mm. You're the one who disciplined them, but they want you to be the one who comforts them. Mm. They want That tells you that they want back in. Mm. Okay? Um, another, th- an, another important principle is that we discipline for attitudes. Uh, not simply for um, throwing a baseball and breaking the vase, mm. right? We would discipline for attitudes. So uh, if someone was surly or just grumpy and not being civil, we would address address that. Mm. And what that means is that you're dealing, uh, instead of trying to weed the garden with three-foot-tall Canadian thistle, uh, what you're doing is going out to the garden at five in the morning and pulling up weeds that are the size of your thumbnail. Mm. Okay. You're when you discipline for attitudes, it is, it is manifest. It's obvious it's there. Um, it might be roll of the eyes. It might be, you know, what, whatever it is, yeah. but if you're on it, that's simply, um, keeping short accounts, making dis, uh, monitoring, the fact that we're going to keep short accounts on an extremely fine filter. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you picked up on this, but one time um, someone, one of our adversaries uh, posted a, uh, a clip of my wife, Nancy, uh, describing disciplining for attitudes yeah. uh, one time. I, I and the clip, seen. okay, well, it went viral. Nancy uh, was describing um, she dropped off uh, one of our daughters at a at a neighbor's house at a friend's house, and when she came to pick her up, um, the, our daughter sort of eh, I don't want to go I don't want to go it was, and so uh, she was disciplined for that when she got home, and then the next time uh, the, before they did this drop off play date, Nancy said, "Now this time, when I come and pick you up, I want you to say hi, mom." When I arrive, I want a hi, mom, um, and happy to go. Well, anyway, there was just a clip of her describing that scenario, mm. and it went stratospheric, like over a million views wow. of people yelling and hollering about how mean and abusive you are controlling your ch- controlling your children's attitudes. Mm. But we're parents. Of course we're supposed to, to, to address our our children's attitudes. Don't talk to don't talk to me that way, young man. Yeah. Th- th- what are you doing? You're you're dealing with attitudes. Right. And and you're and you're dealing with the weed before the weed has taken deep root. Hmm. What is this, in that example that you gave of the video that went viral? It's so funny how things uh, get picked up and go viral like that. But. Yeah. Um, what is the what is the expectation for the child? And that was so like if if I have a grumpy child at home and they're clearly giving an attitude about something and they're not really even saying much, but just their overall attitude is poor and affecting the family environment. What is the expectation for you? Don't get to do that. 
Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. We, no. And in our home, we are going to be cheerful. Hmm. We're going to love each other. We're going to be cheerful. And, um, and now if the person is, is saying, oh, mom, I, I'm just kind of, I've just got the blues. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you don't spank them for that. Yeah. Um, one of our favorite family stories is uh, when our oldest daughter was uh, a young girl. One day she was, you know, had rainy day blues kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nancy said, well, until you feel, why don't you go into your bedroom and just uh, read your Bible for a little bit? Mm-hmm. You know, like a, it's a corrective positive discipline, but you don't get to be a rain cloud raining on everybody else. You, you just don't get to do that. Mm. So Nancy suggested that, that she just go into the bedroom and, and, and uh, seek an attitude adjustment, just reading her Bible for a little bit. And so she went back there, and then a short time later, this voice comes out of the bedroom saying, Mom, where, where's that place where the fat king got stabbed? And the, <laughs> and the, <laughs> and I, I need a little inspiration. Yeah, pick, little inspiration little pick, pick me up. Me yeah. up. Pick, pick. <laughs> That's anyway, um, one of the uh, a lot uh, having a sense of humor, deep affection for one another, enjoying one another's company, uh, and not letting people develop a hostage taking approach to their attitudes. I think what you're saying is when, when I heard you originally talk about that, it really was I had never heard that perspective on on discipline and, and parenting, um, and I think one of the reasons. Um, that it might be challenging is because for many of us parents, we want quick fixes and what you're describing is not a quick fix. It requires right. whole transformation of your family. It requires, like you said, the house to be picked up right. <laughs> and it would be easier just to, you know, shuffle things around, but you're talking about an environmental change in your household. Right. And, and more than that, uh, there's a fundamental, I'm sorry for interrupting, but there's a fundamental thing because if I'm, if I'm going to require my kids to have disciplined emotions and attitudes, then it's got to start with me. Yeah. All right. So if, if the kids don't get to snap at one another, well, mom and dad don't get to snap at anybody. Yeah. Right. And so uh, you're right that the uh, instituting something like this is global. And and it affects how mom and dad talk to each other, mm-hmm. how mom or dad talk to the kids, because you can't just enforce, don't pop off at me, young man, but you get to pop off at him. Right? Right. Um, so the other illustration I use is, let's say you're, um, you've got some, your seven-year-old boy is balancing peas on his knife at the dinner table. <laughs> it's impressive, and, yeah impressive and the the task challenged him he thought of it and he he's working away (laughs) way at it and let's say dad is a is concerned for manners at the dinner table and and sees that and loses his temper and bites his son's head off don't behave that way at the table Mm -hmm. well why well because it's bad manners to balance peas on your knife i see and it's not bad manners to bite somebody's head off at the dinner table Mm -hmm. that's not um Biting someone's head off is a thousand times worse than mm. peas on the knife because yeah. the Bible talks about that. It doesn't say anything about peas and knives. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Although, think, uh, yeah, I, I think another part of that too. I mean, another layer of that, which I found actually convicting just personally, was um, changing the environment, but also having to ask myself as a man, why am I not joyful? Which goes back to some of those short accounts of sin and the illness. Like, what have I led in my life? Am I right. uh, fearful about our culture and world and political environment? Goes back mm-hmm. to the very beginning of our conversation. Am I stressed about money and job and finances? Or have I not dealt with certain things in my marriage that need to be dealt with? And now my kids are getting the brunt of that stress. Uh, right. uh, is there is their own sin in my life, unconfessed sin in my life that is festering and building right. and causing angst in my soul that my kids are getting the brunt of. I mean, a lot of that is, I would rather you say, Jared, if you just do, uh, you know, count to three and then say these five words to your kids, you'll get them to have appropriate behavior. What you're saying is not that it's not a mathematical equation. It's a spiritual environmental change. Exactly. And, and here's the, you know, this might come across like a form of my Zen Presbyterianism, but, um, there are parents 
who are just nice people Mm -hmm. and they walk with God and they're humble and straightforward and they might do any number of things wrong in their parenting, but it's covered. The check's clear. Uh, because there's a nor- the, the the parents are making an enormous number of deposits that they don't even know about by just being fun people to be with mm. right wow. and then there and then there are parents who do everything by the book right right they're by the book right uh, but they're no fun they're two tons of no fun and and then the checks don't clear well, it's it's how much money you've got in the bank account, right? Um, I can't I can't believe that that dad he he screwed up this way and that way, but his kids love him to pieces, right? Well, that's because he had a couple million dollars in the bank, and yeah, he wrote a couple of ten thousand dollar checks, and that was bad. That was, you know, bad. But the checks cleared, and then there are other parents who are running sort of they've got a cash flow problem. Where they're just ten cents above, mm-hmm. ten cents above, and uh, it, it, uh, here's another way of uh, illustrating it: is that I, I've seen families that you know read the books, and we're going to have family worship, and we're going to have bi- Bible centered, and we're going to do this. You know, it's a checklist kind of thing. It's like it's like parents who saved and scrimped and saved for eight months to take their kids on an all-expense vacation to Disneyland. And then they discovered 10 years later that none of the kids even remember having gone. (laughs) (laughs) We spent the better part of a year saving up money to do that. And then another family, uh, the kids get to reminiscing about good times, and the kids say, you remember that time when we stopped in Potlatch on the way back from the river (laughs) and Dad bought popsicles and we spent time... Th- chunking rocks at the tree, <laughs> yeah. and and the fudgesicles cost three dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> right, totally. <laughs> and it's a memory. It's a memory for life. Yeah. Well, what? Uh, we're not in absolute. We we're not in any kind of control over what our kids are remembering, and so what we want to do is create an environment from which those selections are made, and that environment needs to be an environment of parents and children in fellowship. Right. I think what I'm struggling with uh, is the what we talked about at the beginning and the kids that, that kind of wander when they're older. And one of the things you said, one of the reasons you talked about trust, but one of the reasons is maybe they were too lax. They didn't have proper discipline and boundaries. And so when my head, I, I go to uh, inappropriately an extreme version of that, of what you're talking about. It's like, well, I'll just be the really fun dad. And you lose sight of all the boundaries. And now I'm a, we're a garden of yes. And, you know, eat, eat all the popsicles and go play as late as you want and do whatever you want. You know, I'm, I'm the fun dad. So I'm trying to build up the relational bank here. You know, that's yeah. where my brain goes. So here's, the, um, and this is, here's another round of Zen Presbyterianism. So let's say two dads and they've got a teenage son and both dads uh, uh, require their son to ch- uh, split and, and stack a cord of wood. Mm-hmm. Winter's coming. We need the we need the wood split and stacked. And one dad uh, is basically utilizing free labor f- from his son. Yeah. And the attitude is, I don't have to do it. He can do it. He's younger than I am, and I'm going to take adv- I'm going to take advantage of this. Son, y- you can do this. Uh, the other dad is has his son split and stack the wood, but the son knows that his father is giving him a work ethic. Mm-hmm. So, so, so in you've got this two fathers, two sons, same amount of wood, but everything is dispositional. So the 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 son in one scenario knows that his father uh, is giving him something. And the other son feels put upon because of how the dad assigned it, how the dad sprung it on him at the last minute. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't have to do this. There are all kinds of tells yeah. that that surround this, and and so there are. There's a golden rule thing here too. 
So let me give you uh, another way of illustrating this principle is you know what it's like in the summertime when the, well, I don't know where you live, so, but here in Idaho, uh, it's light out till 9, 9.30 mm -hmm. in, in, in the middle of the summer. Mm -hmm. And when you've got little kids, school's out, they're in the backyard playing, and they're playing hard. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know what I mean by playing hard. Mm -hmm. They're just going. Now, a, a foolish father is going to walk out on the back porch and say, time for bed. <laughs> Because what what's happening is the kids are all going 60 miles an hour, and you just th uh, ran them right into a brick wall, mm. right? How, how are they supposed to turn around on that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you're 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 not remembering their frame. You're not remembering what it's like to have been a kid playing hard in the summertime in the backyard. Mm. And you say, but the kids have to go to bed. Uh, you know, we're, we have to, we're going on vacation in the morning. They have to get up early. You know. Okay, great, great. Uh, what you should do, though, is walk out on the back porch and say, 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. Because what you're doing is remembering their frame. You're remembering, you're, you're obeying the golden rule. How would you like to be a kid in that position who was having the time of his life and all of a sudden, he's expected in 30 seconds to be ready to, to snooze. Yeah. Right. Right. That, uh, life's not like that. So uh, this, is what, this is another example of parents being thoughtful. Mm. Uh, parents in, uh, living life in an, in, in an anticipatory way. Um, uh, and, and that kind of thing gets communicated, and the, and the kids know that you're for them, hmm. all right? This is, uh, I mean, who thought of that, right? One of the things when our kids were little, uh, when Nancy used to give them baths, um, she would put them in the bathtub and then throw the towel in the dryer. Hmm. So uh, when they got out, they had a hot, <laughs> hot towel. Like, and they're, you know, you've got this little three-year-old <laughs> kid, you think, I must be a member of the country club. <laughs> 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 They're treating me like royal. Yeah. Yeah, this is um I think a lot of what you're talking about too is it it takes a slowing down. Even when we talked about the short accounts, it takes a kind of swallowing of pride. Um, you know, like I having a short account with my wife when you were talking about that, one of the first stories that came to mind is and uh she said something to me as a as a joke uh in the bathroom. We're both getting ready, brushing our teeth getting ready. She says something to me as a joke, but it had a hint of truth that pricked a nerve. Okay. And instead of having a short account with her, I let that fast. She tried to immediately have a short account. What did I clearly offended you? What did I say? That was hurtful. You know, what, how can I, what story are you writing in your head? How can we make this right? Me way too much pride. Uh, you know, I let that build up and fester. It turned into an all day argument because I did not have a short account. Right. Um, but a lot of that is, one swallowing your pride and just two a lot of patient like just you know, i'm going to be patient here i'm going to not make myself the main character of this story in the family i want to and uh and even the way that you de you describe discipline with your dad coming down and him you know spanking you and then uh as far as i as under uh, from my perspective it's forgiven and we're ready to move on all of that is slow and intentional which for most of us parents it just feels like I'm disciplining because I'm annoyed and I need something to ch I need your behavior to change quickly. Oh. You know what I mean? Oh, thank you. Uh, there's another in principle just reminded me of this. And that's Galatians 6:1. If anyone is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, mm. considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Mm. So the pr problem with parents is that when we're motivated to discipline, we're not qualified. Mm. And when we're qualified, we're not motivated. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, consider yourself. So uh, in a spirit of gentleness, if a brother's overtaken in a trespass, so I've got my brother here who just mouthed off to his mom, right? And I've got to do something. If I, if I just want to keep reading my book or if I wanted to keep doing what I was doing, I'm not motivated to discipline because I'm not annoyed. Hmm. Because I'm not annoyed, getting up to deal with it would be an act of obedience on my part hmm. instead of an act of irritation. 
when I'm motivated to go correct him because I'm irritated or annoyed at him, I'm motivated by sin, which means I'm not qualified to do what I'm about to undertake to do. Huh. Right. Right. So, uh, and this is, so this is another fundamental principle. Don't discipline your kids when you're disqualified. Wow. All right. Now you might say, well, this really is a screamer. It needs, you know, I need to discipline. So I'd say, have their kid, have the kid go to their room. And then you go to the end of the bathroom or somewhere and get right with God. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's not a trace of, uh, personal, personal angst in it. Yeah. Um, uh, so consequently, and this is the this is very much the way it was uh, in the discipline I experienced growing up, and the way we did it with our ch- children is we wanted it to be judicial, uh, judicial and judicious. So we disciplined calmly, not in anger. We wanted to be the magistrate with the black robe behind the bench. Mm. This is just this is the law of. Um, this is the law of order and decorum in the universe, mm. and God has uh, has tasked me with the uh, with the responsibility of correcting you when you do things like this. But I would sp- I would speak to my kids in the same tone of voice that I'm using right now. Mm. Right, this is this is what you did. This is where the Bible says you're not supposed to do this sort of thing, um, and because of that, I'm going to give you swats. And I want you to cooperate with me. I don't want you to fight me. And then usually it was something like three SWATs, mm. um, unless it was some high-profile high problem. Um, three three SWATs, and then I hold you until you're done crying, and then I pray with you, mm. and then say it's all forgiven. It's completely and totally forgiven. You're welcome to rejoin the family at any, any time as soon as you're prepared to walk in that forgiveness. Mm. Um, and that's, that's how it should come down. But I, I have to be under God's authority while I'm doing it. Yeah. If I'm angry or annoyed or irritated or frazzled, um, then I shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. I should go get right with God before I do that. Another uh, thing, if I'll just, if you don't Please, mind, no, I'm soaking uh, it all in. Yeah. Uh, tagging here. One of the reasons we used a, a wooden sp- spatula, a spanking spoon, um, to discipline. Um, and part of the reason for doing that is when you spank on bare buns with your hand, one of the things that can happen is it can sting you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and, and some parents, when they spank their kids and they hurt themselves, that can tip them over the line into, uh, uh like a retaliatory, mm thing. You never want to be adversarial with your kids. You never want to be retaliatory with your kids. You want it to be simply this son, I'm going to give you three swats because it's the law of heaven that this sort of thing gets three swats. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right. And, and I'm going to, and I'm going to do it. And then we're going to be fine. And in fellowship afterwards. Right. Right. Mm. Um, when you're thinking through your discipline and that I'm just constantly trying to contrast that having an environment with joy while also giving these strict boundaries so that they know that there are, there's a, I, I picture it as a big sandbox to play in. There's lots of freedom to play within the sandbox, but you know, the boundaries. And when you cross them, yeah. you've stepped outside of the design of God and, and for our family. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on, I think a big part of my motivation here, I have a 13-year-old son, so he just turned 13. I have one son, 13, and three younger daughters. A big motivation for me right now in the current stage of parenting is to train him up to become confident as a man as I get ready to send him out into the world. Um, Some would call that rite of passage process. What are your... uh, Part of my motivation there, um, or maybe my angst, is like I only have what feels like a few more years left before he leaves this house. And I really want to just, <laughs> I've got very little time and I'm trying my best to make sure that he really does feel confident and secure. And he's got the tools needed to go out there and be a faithful man of God. Um, I guess it's a two part question. One, trying to balance that. I also just want to, I want him to be like, man, dad loves me and he delights in me. And I want to listen to, I don't want to be the dad that just 
sends him out to cut all the wood because he's 13 and able to do it, but because I'm, he knows I'm trying to train him um, and actually right. has joy. And then also, um, you know, do you have any thoughts on rite of passage in that training of young manhood? Yeah. I, I love and appreciate the fact that cultures do have rites of passage, and unfortunately, ours really doesn't. Yeah. Right? Um, there are there were things that approximated it um and but unfortunately the the erosion you know like uh the closest thing i could think of is someone becoming an eagle scout mm -hmm. or something like that yeah. um where it was activities and things learned that were geared to boyhood that were aimed at manhood yeah right um uh, so if you if you accomplish something like this as a boy it mattered when you were a man right <laughs> Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, it's the kind of thing, there are certain things that you can do as a boy that you would still put on your resume as a man. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, unfortunately, Christian fathers are going to have to ad hoc it, um, where it, um, you say, and you'd have to take into account your son's frame, your son's abil abilities, you know, all the, all the different things. Yeah. So my brother, my brother-in-law, for example, um, with his son, he, uh, he bought a Mustang and they took the, uh, they took the Mustang, he and his son took the Mustang apart. Every part that could be separated from any other part wow. was taken apart. They com they completely took it down, had, um, ha had all the pieces redone, um, uh, powder, um, treated mm -hmm. the various parts and then reassembled the whole thing. This is their project together. Wow. It was a shoulder to shoulder right. project, right? Um, that, uh, and that has the advantage of fathers not falling into the trap of trying to treat their son like they were a couple of girls. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, take your son out for dinner and let's have a heart to heart talk. I'm not against heart to heart talks, but for guys, heart to heart talks need to be shoulder to shoulder yeah. and they have to come up by the way, rather than let's, let's communicate you and I, right. Let, uh, let's talk about our relationship. Well, that's kind of a girl thing to say. <laughs> Totally. Right, I agree with you. I'm just reemphasizing all the reasons why you might be controversial in to, in this day and age. But I agree. I agree with you. Uh, one, right. just as a man and knowing all the deep conversations I've had with my guy friends from the time I was, yeah. you know, seven years old to today, all, all of them they've never been over a cup of coffee at Starbucks. You know, right. that always felt forced and awkward. Um, right. They've always been. It in, happens on, when you're hunting. Yeah. It happens when you're. Uh, yeah, yeah, it happens. Men need to communicate totally. with one another. Yeah. And fathers need to communicate with their sons. But they need to communicate like men. Yeah. Uh, the, the way men do. Um, and so, uh, and fathers should create opportunities uh, uh, where they can give input to their sons, right. input that matters. So one of the things that I did, for example, when uh, I've got two, uh, two girls and one boy, um, one of the things I did is I coached. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I've, I've played sports and I've done that sort of thing, but I'm not the coachy type, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, but nevertheless, I coached uh, lacrosse and I coached different, you know, I, I did, uh, different things that way in order to have opportunities where I would speak into the life and behavior and, um, uh, performance of my son mm -hmm. and other people's sons th as well. But it was that I wanted to cultivate that kind of working, working relationship and put myself into positions where that, uh, was necessary. Yeah. That, that became necessary. And my son is, uh, doing that now. He, he's, um, he's coached, uh, Logos schools, basketball team last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and his his son, my grandson, is on the team he, that he's coaching. He's done the same sort of thing. So those are uh, uh, catch it as it goes by rites of passage, yeah. because there we don't have 
a Protestant Christian evangelical form of the bar mitzvah or the form of the uh, becoming an Eagle Scout. Yeah, and even the uh, my friend uh, John Tyson talks a lot about this. He's written a book on rite of passage, but he talks about even in the Mormon culture, there is more of a setup for the young men to go through some kind of formalized process. Um, but I, I agree with you. There isn't. We haven't really set something up in the evangelical world to do this well. Um, if you have time, I, I, I know I'm, I'm taking a lot of your time here. Um, one, I just want to, any resources that you, you currently have, you know, it sounds like you've written books on this that you could point us to, but before you get to those kind of practical next steps for our listeners, um, I know education is a huge part of what you guys are doing. Um, can you just speak to education and any, I'll let you just kind of take that in any direction. We've got a lot of moms and dads who are listening to this right now, who are trying to educate their kids homeschool, public school, private school, all the things. What are you, what would you want to say to a bunch of parents, a room full of parents as you have their attention right now on education? Okay. This is going to be a, another one of controversial those ones. Uh, or? No, controversial okay. Ones. Um, I would tell parents whose kids are in the government school. I would ex- exhort them as I, I know they're difficult situations. I know they are single mom situations. I know that there are court decisions that require public education, but wherever possible, get your kids out of the government schools. Just um, do what it takes. Mm. If if it's possible to get them out, get them out. And that's because you want uh, the the task of parenting is challenging enough just in a fallen world without you having to undo yeah. what was done to them for eight hours. You've got two hours in the evening to undo what they did for, for eight hours, and you don't even know what they did, so you're not, you're not sure what you can do to undo it. So you, what you want to do is either homeschooling or homeschool co-ops or in a, a, a traditional uh, private Christian school. You want your kids in an environment dominated by the Word of God where the people, the instructors and the people who are helping you in the task of educating your children are roughly rowing in the same direction that you are. Mm, that's well said. Okay, yeah. okay. so um, um, that that's what I would urge parents to do educationally. Yeah. Um, now, on the on the resources, I've, so I've written a number of books on on all of this. Um, a couple of books, well, two or three on education, um, uh, recovering the lost tools of learning, the case for classical Christian education. And the Padea of God and um, uh, Excused Absence. Mm. Those are books I've written on education. And then on child rearing, I've written um, Standing on the Promises. I've written Future Men, specifically for uh, training boys. Mm. Um, uh, I've written another small book, Why Children Matter. Um, uh, so there, and if you go to Canon, uh, Canon Press, and Canon Plus is a streaming service. There are a number of these books that are categorized uh, um, under family resources, mm. um, and a number of them are available in audio. Um, so that's yeah. We'll put links to all those. Yeah, you've written tons of you've you've got a lot of resources out there. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for uh, for taking the time. Oh, I, I was going to say on the I just spoke at a uh, we homeschool, and so I was asked to speak at a homeschooling. Uh, tech, one of Texas, if not Texas' largest homeschooling um, convention recently. And they um, they shared with me that um, since COVID, homeschooling has doubled in the United States and it has tripled in Texas, which I thought was really fascinating. Not surprising, yeah. but... Um, yeah, really good sign. Yeah, fascinating. So thank you, Pastor. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man, so this, this, was, uh, this meant a lot to me. Thank you so much. All right, you're most welcome. Thank you.